Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, you guys. Welcome, welcome. All right. So, you know, my new podcast plan is to like try to stick to one topic, you know, to make it easier to search, to make it more digestible for you guys. So what I do is I like throughout the week, I write down my little nuggets that aren't really a full podcast, you know, that I've been starting out with. And, and then I write, I have a whole notebook full of like podcast ideas based on questions that I get, um, discussions we have in the Oh Crap Cafe, these kinds of things. So today I was like, I thought I had the nugget and I thought I had the podcast idea. And then the nugget, as I was like, you know, doing dishes and puttering around the house this morning and I went to the gym and then I was like, wait a minute, I think this nugget is the podcast. And I think the podcast idea is the nugget. So I'm going to give it a whirl. I may have to record this, but if you're listening to this recording, it worked. (laughs) All right. So one thing that's been coming up so much in my work is the notion that parenting is like one and done. Oh, I already, I already told them that, or they already learned that, or we're done that phase. Nothing in childhood is like a a hard done, right? Like potty training, there's no finish line. You don't just cross it and now you're done. You don't have to worry about it. There's no accidents. It just kind of fades, right? All milestones are that way. It's like, it just becomes part of your life. Like when your kid first learns to ride a bike, it's so exciting. You got to watch them. It's so, oh my God, are they going to fall? And then it just kind of fades and pretty soon they're going to the neighbor's house, right? It's never this like, ta-da, you ride the bike, you're all set. You're never going to fall all set. I have come to the conclusion and I've said it in a couple of podcasts and I think I'm just going to keep using this all the time. I have come to the conclusion that if I could sum up parenting in two words, it would be relentless consistency. So what I'm seeing all over the place right now is complete inconsistency in parenting, but expecting the child to just show up and do what is asked, even though there's been complete inconsistency. Largely, this has to do with boundaries and or a routine in your home. And so if you can keep those words on the tip of your parenting brain, relentless consistency, Teaching our children anything from language to manners to boundaries to the rules in our house to our expectations, these are all relentless consistency. That's how they learn. Because you say it one time or because you've applied logic to the situation, doesn't matter to your child, (laughs) right? And so... I, like always, when I look at relentless consistency, I say, well, what's getting in people's way? And for the most part, I would say it's exhaustion, it's mental mental illness, but not like, not like diagnosable, but like us not taking care of our mental space. So we're maybe depressed, we're anxious, we are And of course, I'm not talking about like clinical depression or even clinical anxiety. I think everybody's just a little on edge, right? Work, work we now take home with us. Phones, we're always on our phone. We're juggling too much. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? But that is the thing that gets in the way of relentless consistency. Boundaries are constantly skewed with food, with sleep, with all these kinds of things. Yes. Because we're tired and we don't have the capacity. And I understand that, but we have to get better at figuring out what the, what, where we can get more capacity or where we can slow down. And so one of the things I was thinking about in this context. So that was going to be the podcast, (laughs) but then that's really all I have to say, but now we have to pull it apart and expound it in different things. So I think this will probably be a touchstone that I'll come back to time and time and time again. Did you just hear how relentlessly consistent I was with that? (laughs) When I look at where people are getting into the most parenting trouble, but also having the hardest time struggling as parents always seems to be 
the witching hour on. Now, the witching hour is generally somewhere in the three to six range, depending on, you know, who's home with the kids? Are the kids home yet? You know, this is going to vary situation from situation. I know a lot of parents are just kind of walking in the door from work and daycare at like 536. So it's really when your child is at their worst because they're tired, they may be hungry. You're at your worst because your battery is getting drained by the second, right? If it's not already drained. So I find that to be the place where things get really skewed, where inconsistencies pop up all over the place. Now, when we're inconsistent with our parenting, the biggest thing we have to do is take ownership. And this is another thing that I'm finding I'm coming down to. It's always us. It's always us, you guys. Yeah. So we have either unconsciously taught some bad habits and behaviors in our kids or We are being inconsistent and yet we keep expecting the kids to fall in line, but they're like, what, what does happen? This isn't the same, right? So when we take apart the witching hour, which we've talked kind of endlessly about earlier eating for kids, right? But I think there's some other things that we can play that we can go into. One of the things is a family walk after dinner. Now, if you are doing an early dinner and maybe everybody's not home, that's okay. You can do the walk then. But in an ideal situation, I would love for this to be the whole family. So one thing that happens, of course, in the clusterfuck is kids need connection time, right? Walks after dinner are awesome to level off blood sugar, right? It, it instantly stabilizes blood sugar, even if you ate like shit, which I don't want you eating like shit. But if you did, the best thing you can do is go for a walk. <laughs> so it's super helpful. The thing I like about it, and I'm hearing from a lot of clients that do a family walk, is it becomes a talisman of the day. It becomes a thing we do. We do this as a family. And if you can get outside no matter what the weather, except it's super extreme weather, you know, have good rain gear or umbrellas or anything like that. And it's helpful now that the sun is, you know, staying out longer. Uh, so we have more time. It becomes a ritual, a ritual that your kids can depend on. It can be a ritual that you can take when you travel. And kids need these rituals as talisman, right? They need them as touch points they're grounding. They're like framework to your routine. And I just love this idea. And I know it's going to be different from everybody. And of course, if you live in a very dangerous area, you may not be able to go out after dusk. You know, these, there's all kinds of caveats. I understand that, but it's something to strive for. And if it's not a family walk after dinner, it can also be a family walk in the morning. If you have, you know, if everybody's up and you have the time, I know that's not always available, but You know, I always say Pascal used to wake up just so brutally at 5.30. Like his range was 5.28 to 5.36. And so we had so much time, even when he was in daycare, preschool and kindergarten. Like I remember it snowing. We could go out, build a snowman, shovel the driveway, come in, have a cup of hot chocolate, play a board game, do his homework, and then be at school on perfect time. So (laughs) there's something to be said about the early risers, but whenever you can, right. And maybe if, if it's really hard for you, maybe it's just the weekends, but again, it becomes something to ground the family, to bring the family into routine. And I love that because we're missing out on the simple joys. And I think what happens, especially if you work outside the home, both parents, maybe high pressure jobs. So they're coming home late. I mean, I work with some clients who really spend very minimal time with their kids during the week. And so weekends become like all the more important to them. But then what happens is I think we have parental guilt that our kids might be missing out on things and, or we are kind of at a loss. Like it's sometimes it's so helpful to have activities because we don't have to engage with our kids, right? Sometimes kids are boring, (laughs) Like, especially two or three year olds, it's not like you're having scintillating conversation. And sometimes our kids are really needy because they miss us and need that connection time. And when that happens, we, it can be easier to have them in activities, to keep them busy, to wear them out. But if you are in that situation, chances are your child is probably in some aftercare program, right? 
they haven't seen a lot of you during the week. So connection becomes more important. So I really invite you to not stress the family out, the household out by piling in activities, particularly those overstimulating ones. I always refer to Chuck E. Cheese, but I'll probably get a lawsuit at some point. (laughs) But I think that's the max, right? But we have places, I know around here we have trampoline parks, but they're not just trampoline parks. There's an arcade, there's lights, there's neon lights, there's dodgeball. They're highly stimulating. Are they fun? Yeah. But they also are highly stimulating. Um, There's all kinds of things. I know like Dave and Buster's is kind of like an arcade restaurant. I, I think I've been in that once. I don't like those. I don't like them personally as an adult, so I can't I never went to them. It's not out of like any moral superiority or anything. I just, they were too much for my nervous system. So never mind best gals. Um, but you know, but organized, but if you're, if you're just going from activity to activity, that again is where that relentless consistent, that relentless consistency can fade away because you're constantly tired. And so maybe weekends can be a time to recoup. And the family walk, I think is such a great place to build a family dynamic to connect. And I think the more things you do as a family that are just slow going, not just, not, you know, I'm sure you do tons as a family, but not going to Disney, not doing the, you know, in the fall, oh my God, the harvest festivals, right? Like not doing necessarily these really stimulating, organized things, but these like slow roll what are you talking about? I have always loved walks. I have never regretted a walk I went on. And recently, um, Pascal's working and, oh man, because he's, guys, he's going to be 18 June 1st. Can you even believe that? Like those of you who have followed me since he was like six or seven, it's crazy, right? Um, but of course now he's got a life and Maverick really needs like two walks a day. And so if Pascal's not around to walk him in the afternoon, I've been taking him on this, like, I don't know, it's a couple miles around the lake on our property. And he, um, He loves it. And I love it because it almost gives you a new life for the rest of the night. I fade super early. I fade, I start fading at six and then I, and then I ease into my full fade by eight 30. I can't keep my eyes open because I'm such an early riser, but the, um, the walk sort of boosts me up. So then I'll do more, maybe meal prep or, you know, whatever I've got going on in the evening so that I'm not just like after six o'clock because that's a little too early to be fading. But for you guys, that might be just the thing to rejuvenate you, to connect as a family. And this can also help with sibling relations. And it's just a sort of slower, slower way to connect. And I find that hard conversations come out. Like maybe if your kids are a little ahead of you, or maybe you stop at a little park or something, maybe you and your spouse, some things will kind of ferment and come to the surface that was bugging you, or maybe you can just do a check-in. I know whenever I've had a problem in a relationship or even with Pascal going for, we go for a walk because you're not focused on the person. You're not like staring them down. And so I feel like any problems I've ever had with friends, intimate partners, or my child, it works out on a walk. Right. And then it, it, again, it's this, it's a thing you do. Like Pascal used to say to me, you ready? Do do you want to go for a walk? And I'd be like, Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Let's go. (laughs) Now, the other thing about nighttime routine that I wanted to bring in, in addition to the family walk is this, uh, I've been study, not studying. I've been dipping my toe into circadian biology. And I'm going to actually have Sarah Kleiner. Um, she's at Sarah Kleiner Wellness. I'm going to be uh, interviewing her in a couple of weeks because she's an expert on this and, and about how light is really the basis of our biology and how it affects us in every way, shape, or form. For us women, it, it totally messes with our hormones if we're not in line with this. And with our kids, we have an onslaught right now of wrong light. So the, it's the basis of like, basically we should be up with the sun and we should start winding down when the sun goes down. Now, of course that's unrealistic in the winter when the sun goes down at four 30. So we do have to make the adjustments. But one of the things I've been doing is paying attention to my light, right? So I'm always up for sunrise. I just, because I start walking Maverick in the dark, you know, and one of the things 
that you should do, especially at night, but even in the morning, if you wake up in the dark is not hit your eyes with blue light. And that's the light. I'm sure you guys have heard about this by now, the light emanating from your screens, your phone, iPad, television, computer, and a lot of led lights as well. And so what it does is it tricks you into thinking it's like high noon. So your body gets all wonky and the, our bodies are this intricate, beautiful ballet of hormones. And we're learning so much on the daily, like because of technology are what we thought we knew about the human body 10 years ago is nonsense. It's just all nonsense. Like because technology and we can now see things and track things, it's, it's miraculous. This cascade of hormones that are released all the time, be it from light, be it from chewing, be it from touch. So it's so wild when we dive deep into this, but our light, we don't want to, we don't want to trick our brain into thinking it's high noon at nighttime because you're going to release certain hormones. I'm not familiar with all of them. So we'll tap Sarah when she's on the podcast, but I dipped my toe into this because I'm, I'm really, I'm very skeptical, but skeptical in the way that I will try anything. Like uh, as soon as somebody says like, Oh, I tried this. I'm like, I'll try it. And I just want to, I want to see for myself. Did I see what this person saw? Did I feel better? And so much of my life and my health has been like, oh, I guess I'll try it. <laughs> so, but it's not out of like a, mm, like a dumbass thing. Like, all right, I'll just try it. <laughs> it's like skeptical. Like, mm, I don't know about that. So I had been very skeptical about all the buzz about blue light blockers and, or, uh, skeptical and or lazy. I'm like, uh, I'm not going to remember to put those things on. <laughs> and then the also having red lights in your house for after sunset. So red lights are just red light bulbs. They're not necessarily like red light therapy. That's kind of a different ball of wax, but red light there, they sell them on Amazon. It's a uh, uh, night lights. You can get bulbs, you can get lamps. And so I have a few night lights and then a few lamps, just separate lamps that are red light. And so what it is, is number one, it mimics fire light. So it's softer on the eyes and it also has no blue light in it. So you get some ambient light in the house, but you don't have the blue light coming in, which the blue light is the thing that signals your brain like, okay, let's get up. It's, it's noon. Now, remember when you get up in the morning with sun sunrise, I believe I could be misspeaking. So we'll again, tap Sarah out, but I believe your highest point of cortisol is right then. And so that's what you're doing. You're stimulating cortisol throughout the day. If you are getting all this blue light in your eyes as you edge into evening. So what I've been doing over the, let's say past six weeks is I got these red lights and I got I have had blue blockers forever and I just kind of got religious about using them. Be, I, I like to watch like about 20, 30 minutes of TV as I'm stretching. And so I wear them for the TV. I, my phone goes on grayscale after sunset and actually I keep my phone on grayscale as much as possible. And, um, and then there's the red lights around the house. Holy shit, you guys. Like when I say remarkable sleep, it, it and I'm a good sleeper this is next level. And I've really been dicking around the last two weeks. Cause I was like, all right, am I just sleeping well? Like, is this just like a coincidence that I'm just sleeping better? Is this placebo effect? Cause I, I think I'm so susceptible to the placebo effect. Like if I tell my body something, it's like, okay. <laughs> so I've been playing on and off with like, not not wearing the blue light blockers and just having the regular lights, the incandescent lights or, you know, LED, so many things are just LED just because they are and not wearing the blue blockers, keeping my phone on the regular thing. And I did it two nights ago and I had the shittiest sleep. Oh my God. I tossed, I turned, I could not get comfortable. And it felt like I just couldn't get comfortable. And then I was like, Oh my God. Okay. And then I keep bouncing back and forth to test the theory. This is legit. The reason I'm telling you this ahead of time before my interview with Sarah is that I think a lot of bedtime struggles are because our kids are too well lit. Yeah. The house is too well lit for our kids. I should say the kids aren't lit. <laughs> the kids are all lit up, <laughs> but the house is too well lit. So that be very conscious of that. And I think what's really beautiful about the red light is it mimics fire light. So if you don't want to deal with candles, you know, candlelight can be tricky with toddlers. I'm sure candlelight would be beautiful too, if you're so inclined, but you want to make sure you shut off 
overhead lights. And I see a lot of this on social media. People call it the big light. And I have never been a fan of the big light, but you want to make sure big lights are off and you want to get a couple of those red lamps so that they're, there's just a softer ambient light and it cues the body to settle down and to go to sleep. So going to sleep is more effortless and staying asleep. But again, I feel like it goes back to that sort of forming of a routine, forming of these rituals that really help our little guys, these rituals of of touch points throughout the day so they know what's coming, they know what to look forward to. Um, Okay, it's time for the red lights, mommy. And then you have this beautiful nighttime that just everything slows down. You go for a walk, you come home, you put on the red lights, you start reading stories. It can go so much easier. But I really need you guys to give this a try with your kids and the, and the sleep, because I'm just hearing bizarre things with sleep. Kids going to bed at 10 o'clock at night. I'm hearing like just struggle, 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 struggles to get kids. And I think what's happening is number one, we're rushing through the nighttime routine, but also I think there's so many boundaries being skewed at, at that witching hour, just because again, our own capacity. So when we think of that, like, Oh, I just, I, I mean, I hear from clients and I, again, I, I sympathize entirely. It's like, I know what it feels like to be that exhausted and to just fuck it. Right. Yeah. Have a candy bar for dinner. Have ice cream for dinner. Yes. Stay up late. I like, like you get to that point of like, I just can't fight. I can't, I can't be the heavy right now. So I understand where it comes from, but we have to, you have to recognize, okay, is this a season in life? Is this something that's happening now because I'm on call for a week? Okay. All right. We're going to get through this, but if it's, there's no end in sight, we have to fix it. And I would say we're, I would say at this point in time, I feel like we are in a crisis as parents of being strung out, anxious, um, exhausted. Parenting is exhausting. It is exhausting. And I will never stop saying this. You guys are in the hardest stage of it where exhaustion is at its peak. It is exhausting. It is fucking hard. How can we change you and your habits and your life to make it easier to keep a fuller battery. I think that's where the focus has to be. And so when we look at that, what does that look like? And I think if we just pull our focus to how can I not drain my battery, then I, I I, I don't have the solution for you because your situation is going to be so different than any, uh, anybody else's. So I don't, I don't, purport to have solutions for every situation. However, I do think if that's where you, if that's where you concentrate on the problem being, you can have more focus on like throughout the day. Oh, oh, this is draining my battery. Like, so I think the last podcast it was, I I mentioned, you know, like just looking through this basket of winter stuff that I need on my daily walk, like not having it organized was like a drain. That was a tiny drain on my battery. So what I'm starting to do myself is like, notice where are these things that drain my battery? Where are these things that suck some life out of me? So then I don't have something left for my kid or for my, my business or for myself. Right. And the other day I was so cranky. I was so depressed about the state of the world. I was, you know, I was like, Oh my God, what is going on here? And I almost thought, you know, I'm, I'm heading in menopause. I'm not, I haven't gone a full year without without a cycle, but it's getting really long between cycles, you know? And so the funny thing about menopause is that you don't know, you never know when it's over. That's why there's menopause babies, right? Cause you, you don't have a period for like four or five months and you're like, okay, here we go. I'm cool. Not true. <laughs> so the, I was even like, oh, maybe I'm getting a period. I like, I was so out of sorts and I realized I hadn't because of my wrist, I'd taken my workouts back a lot a lot. And I was like, okay, I can't do it. Like I, I'm the kind of person that it's so built into my routine. I, I think we all need exercise and movement, but I'm the kind of person that like, it's so built into my routine that I was like, Oh, so I ended up doing, uh, a heavier workout. And I was like, Oh, Jamie, no, like you gotta, you don't have to use your wrist and, and make it hurt more, but you've got to figure out other ways. And so I've been more religious about going to the gym in the morning and I have to off gas that energy. I just do. <laughs> and so, but I'm really starting to notice that. And then I'm noticing like, 
oh, you know, you guys know I fucking, I like, I go in and out of like struggling with social media because like I get stuck in a scroll just like anybody else. And so I'm like, okay, I have to, that is draining. It feels like it's self-regulating. I'm really noticing that like when I start to get like dysregulated, the scroll is very regulating. It's like, yeah, but then I get stuck in it and it's such a fucking waste of time. And Instagram is so toxic right now. Like it's just, it ends up being like, you're giving your soul to all these people and your attention. And so I, you know, I got my stack of books out that I been meaning to read. And so going back to like having those like right on the table so I can read them. Um, and again, my child's grown. So my, how this looks for me in my exhaustion is going to look very different from how it looks for you guys, but start finding those pockets of like, what's really draining me. And I, cause I hear a lot when I'm working with clients that it is the activities, it's the out of the house, it's the transitions. So if you can minimize those and have a quieter existence for right now, that might be the solution, you know? But again, I, I, and that family walk, I just, a client after client that does the family walk is just like, oh my God, this is the best thing we instituted. And even when the kids don't necessarily want to, and they're a pain and you may not go very far, I still think it's something like, this is what we do. And I think it teaches kids that like, just because you have a feeling about it doesn't mean we change the family dynamic. You can have feelings about everything, but this is what we do. This is how our family life goes. This is how our evening goes. So, so give that a shot and report back. Cause I'd love to hear about it. And I think I covered all those bases. Yeah. And again, I, to me, these tie in seamlessly, but I don't know. Sometimes I think I'm off base with what I think ties together, but I think it's just another component of that relentless consistency that will help it will help build that muscle so that you have this, this routine, this, these rituals, this rhythm to your day that really helps calm our little ones and keep them regulated rhythm and routine. Yeah. I really like those two words. All right. I'm going to let you guys go as always. I appreciate you and I appreciate you listening and rock on and have a beautiful day. Okay. Bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. (laughs) You can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.